Executive with HSG. We're in the leading advisory services firm uh, working with game changing leaders around the world on improving team dynamics. Uh, and I'm joined today by Andrea Juan Roman, who, uh, quite frankly, from the moment we met Andrea, we're blown away by your understanding of teams uh, and how you understand where teams make sense. Uh, and so that is, you know, we'll, we'll hear from Andrea today about where teams make sense, how we leverage teams. And then Liana uh, Bailey Primmons, who CIO at uh, CalPERS, and really hearing your story of how you took a group of, worked with a group of individuals uh, by discipline understanding and using an analytical approach uh, to improve team dynamics and really bringing a group of well-performing individuals together uh, as a team. So uh, you may have um, heard uh, that we, um, sorry, let that thing pause for a moment. Okay, uh, so today is really about understanding and hearing where teams make sense and how we leverage teams. Um, well, originally when we started the session, we had talked about um, joining with one speaker, and now we have the opportunity for you all to hear for two. So to maximize that time for you to get the most of the session, we've made a slight tweak, uh, and so we'll be able to hear from Andrea about teams and where they really make sense, as well as hear Leona's case study uh, with teams. So, with that said, fifty-eight percent. Any guesses on what fifty-eight percent stands for? Represents anyone? What was that? Project teams. One well, good guess. Anyone else? Fifty-eight percent stands for the average amount of time people in this room reported spending in their teams. 58% of the time, that's more than half of our time, half of our days are spent in teams. Now, the question is, is how much of that time, how much additional time do we spend really thinking about and analyzing how to improve those teams so that they're optimized? Are you spending nearly that much time? No, I see some, no. How much time on average day we probably spend doing that? Not much. <laughs> exactly. So we have these teams. We talk about teams. We throw this idea of teams around. Uh, and yet, we're really not quite sure how to optimize them. Where do we spend the time? Where do we focus? And when do they make sense? So today, really clear and getting a sense from Andrea, uh, Deputy, uh, Chief Deputy Director of Policy at California Department of Technology, who understands the fundamentals of teams. And so, with that said, turn it over to Andrea. So I'm going to do two things at once. Actually, three. So I'm going to talk, hold the mic, and clip. Um, <laughs> so, uh, first of all, thank you for your time this morning and for coming into this session because I, I believe the concept of teams is really, really critical to the effectiveness of state government, um, and more so even. Uh, to the concept of government transformation, right? Because the, the idea of transformation may begin with one person, but one person alone can't make that transformation happen. That transformation has to be done by groups of people who have a common interest and who have a desire to go and do something different, right? So, um, when I was asked about my perspective of teams, um, you know, I, I kind of laughed a little bit only because I, I kind of believe we're born into a team. Right, from, from our very first day in this world, we become part of a team, and that team is really the family. Right, And um, for those of you that are part of a team, family, I'm gonna guess all of you. Um, <laughs> um, you know, you, you exist for a purpose within that unit, and, and you all strive for the same, and purpose in that unit is that is for the sustainability of, of your family, right? Um, and very early on, we do this thing with our kids that I think starts to form a lifelong perspective of how to be effective and how to get things done. And that is that we have our kids enroll in sports. So how many of you have either played some type of organized sport or have watched your children play an organized sport? 
Yeah, so you, you all know what I'm talking about, right? I've, I've coached soccer for about 15 years. Um, I coach um, softball, I coach basketball, uh, and all for my kids. And I grew up playing every sport that they would allow girls to play back when I was a kid. And, um, and I would I always tell the girls, because I coach girls, and I always tell the girls um, from the very, very early on, from U5 soccer players all the way up to U16, U17 soccer players, um, the same thing, and that is that you know, playing soccer isn't just about you individually going out there and playing a sport, right? It's about you bringing your skill to the table to contribute to the greater good. And that's a skill that is really important to learn as early on as you can. The other thing that it is for girls, and, and the women in the audience might appreciate this, men maybe not, not so much, um, is that it teaches us something that inherently we don't have, and that is the desire to fight for something, right, that is ours. We're very good, and I would watch my U5s, and I would, in the very early years, I'd get frustrated with them because they would knock, you know, they would accidentally push a kid over, and, and they would both be going for the ball, and they would stop. The girls would stop, and they would go and pick up the other person, and they would make sure they're okay, and that's great, right? That, that great, you know, need to make sure everybody's okay, that's amazing because that's what makes us human. But at the same time, I'm yelling, get the ball, right? Because, hello, we're out there to score goals and win. Um, and, and so it's, you know, we start to teach that whole concept very, very early on. And I believe that that is what gets, makes us successful as we go into the workplace. Whether we strive to be in, in management, in executive leadership, I don't think that matters. I don't care if you're an office tech in an organization, your role in that organization is critical to the overall success of the end game of whatever your, your program is about, right? So when we talk about teams, you know, from a, a dictionary perspective, and this is from businessdictionary.com, you know, a, a, you've seen this, right? I'm not gonna read it to you. You've seen this many, many times in different forms, different variations, but a team really is about a group of people coming together, bringing their skills to the table, and, and working toward a common goal or a t common end. Um, and it's in doing this <clears throat> that we become, I think, successful. So you see, you know, the bottom there, a team becomes more than just a collection of people when there's a strong sense of mutual commitment because that creates synergy, right? So what did I say in the beginning? That we don't, we can't transform by ourselves. We transform as a unit, as a team. That's that synergy that I believe is really important. And it's why I think it's important that we start to recognize that regardless of what your role is in an organization, regardless of what position you have, you're part of a team. Unless, and, and please, if you fit this category, raise your hand for me because I'd like to talk to you afterwards. Unless you have a role in a state department that is so incredibly independent of anybody else around you. Right, I mean, we don't. And it's interesting because the whole concept of team really started to become alive when we started to move into technologies, right? Because we started to have to take a look at what the business process was around what it was that we did. So it was no longer about my job sitting at this desk, looking at this piece of paper, and moving this piece of paper from my desk to the person over there, right? With technology, it became about how does what I do impact everybody else in front of me, and how does everybody else below me impact me? And how do we start to have those dialogues across? And that is when we started to form the concept of teams, right? That together, we all make this happen. Individually, we don't. Because if I came to work every day and just did what I did, and nobody else in front of me did their job, and nobody else beyond me did theirs, would what I did have any value? No, right? So there's lots of types of teams, right? And, and these are all things that you've probably seen or, or you fit into one of these somewhere, somehow. Um, but I think it's important to take a look at the fact that teams are not just projects. Teams are not just sports, right? Teams have take lots of different types of, of positions in organizations. Um, they can be interdisciplinary all within human resources. They can be multidisciplinary. They can cross over multi-sectors of an organization. Um, they become more complex, 
when you become multidisciplinary, right? So it becomes more important to understand each individual's role or participation to, become, to be able to understand the value that you have in helping that overall team succeed. Um, they can be advisory. A team can simply be advisory, where they're there for the purpose of advising others on how to move forward. We hire people and we pay them a lot of money to be advisory, and who are those? Right? Our consultants, our vendor partners. Right? Those are those are team individuals. They're part of our team in state government. Um, but they play advisory roles a lot of times. Um, so there's lots of different ways that, that, lots of different types of teams that are out there, and lots of different ways that you can become active and, and engaged as part of the team. There's four stages of team development. And these are, you know, you've heard this storming, norming, forming, right? All those types of, this is no different. It's the same kind of concept. You know, dependency and inclusion, so what I do is really, really important, right? Um, then there's the whole idea of counter-dependency and fighting. What I do is more important than what you do, right? And trying to determine who's the most important person in that process. Um, and then you get to that point of trust and structure, and that's where I think teams become very important and very, very valuable, is when you as an individual start to recognize that you don't have to be the most important person in the room, right? doesn't matter your status, it doesn't matter your title, you don't have to be the most important person. Everybody collectively can be equally important because what you have to start looking at is dependency of function. Um, and then becomes, you become productive. So when you get to that point of trust and structure, that's where you get to the point of actually making something happen, becoming a productive team. We see this on the, on the soccer, I, you know, I, I love putting everything in the form of soccer because soccer I think is like the most awesome sport there ever was. But, um, <laughs> but when you think about it, right, I mean, I, I think about my, my uh, middle daughter, my 15 year old. You know, when, when she showed up on her high school team last year as a freshman, she really didn't know all the kids on the team. She hadn't played with them. She plays for a, you know, a competitive program coming out of Sacramento. We live up in Folsom. And um, she knew bits and pieces of them, mostly because she probably played against them, right? Because all these, these kids tend to know each other by playing against each other. And, um, and when they came out on this team, you know, so she, she tried out and she made the first couple, she made one tryout session and then couldn't make any others. There were four tryout sessions. She was playing high school basketball at the same time. And we had to go out of town for a, a soccer tournament in Vegas. So she only made one tryout. And she was really feeling like, I don't even know if I'm gonna make the team. I'm really not kind of a part of them. I didn't go out to tryouts, all this, right? So we get back from Vegas and I contact the coach and I said, hey, you know, uh, you know my daughter is, is you know, not sure what she's supposed to do. Did she make the team? Did she not make the team? I know she only hit one, one tryout. And they said, you know, it was kind of callous. And it was like, well, I'll just have her come out this week. But I, you know, tell her she needs to go to the varsity practice. And I was like, okay, that's a statement, right? <laughs> Come out, you're a freshman, come out, play with the varsity players, because we're gonna, we probably don't really need you on the team. We got lots of kids on the team. And so she did that, and she went and she tried out with them. That whole counter-dependency and fighting came into play, right? And she was like, wow, I need to really prove myself and my ability to play with these people that I don't know at all, because these are all juniors and seniors in high school, and I'm a freshman, right? So she had to go out there and really start to look at how could she play that be in there and develop a sense of trust with these girls because their willingness to play with her on that field for that short amount of time was gonna make or break her ability to make the high school team, right? And, uh, and lo and behold, you know, the next day I get a call from the coach and he says, well, okay, she's on the team. Um, she's gonna be one of our extras. We got 25 kids that we're carrying. She may or may not ever play. As a mom, you're going, what? <laughs> So she has her first high school game, I didn't even go. Because the coach said, you may or may not even play. She played half the game. And she spent the rest of the season sitting, you know, minutes out of any quarter, if at all. Um, and so to me, that's where she got to that point of becoming part of that team, right? She felt very isolated, very much not a part of anything, and got to that point of productivity, uh, both for herself and for the benefit of their team. And their team won, I think they won all but maybe one game last year and, and had record number of goals that they scored uh, versus anything that was scored against them. They had five goals the whole season scored against them. So, um, you know, so to me it was interesting to watch that dynamic, right, and go, wow, you know, this is really what it's all about. And this is really how it happens in real life. And 
it's okay. It's okay for you to walk in and at first feel like, I don't have anything in common with these people. You know, I, I'm never going to even embrace what they're doing. Um, why am I even here, right? And to get to that point of going, oh, well, wait a minute. You know, maybe what I do, oh, so you do what? And how do you do that? And then slowly going to that level of developing that trust in the structure and, and getting to productivity. That's normal and it's okay. And that may be one of the most important things for you to walk out of here with, right? Is that teams exist, they're valuable, and it's okay for you not to at first understand how you fit in that team or to embrace it. What's most important for you is for you to acknowledge that that's normal and then to figure out how do you move beyond that. So challenges of teams. I'm gonna talk about this from two different perspectives. Because there's challenges that new teams form. So when it's a brand new team and, and you're the team lead and you get to go and pick all your people, right? The challenges that, that, that exist is making sure there's an agreed upon purpose, that everybody understands why they're there, right? That there's a collective recognition of an end purpose. Selecting the team, that's a challenge, right? Because if you don't bring in the right team members or if you don't, figure out how to develop that right team, it'll create challenges and problems for you as you go forward. Organizing the team, who has what roles? Understanding those roles, understanding the value of those roles as you move forward in the team. And then evaluating the team. Uh, it becomes really important to, to recognize that, you know, it's not just about having a team, but it's then also understanding and, and, and identifying when teams are successful and when they're not. Because when we're not doing things that we need to be doing, that's when we have the opportunity to improve, right? If we don't acknowledge those things that we're not doing well or right, we potentially put ourselves in an area of failure because those things can slowly become much larger and can slowly consume the greater good of, of the team's purpose. So one of the things you'll hear Leanna talk about is that concept of measurement. Um, and measuring individuals and identifying their, their individual role and how that comes into play with measuring the overall collective role of the team itself. Um, and then attitude is everything. I, I very much believe that. Uh, you bring in your own personal attitude to everything you do um, and, and you make the choice as to whether or not you're going to allow this to be a good experience or a bad experience. I'm asked many times, you know, people will see me and, and I've worked in, in some very high stress positions um, and I've worked in some very crazy departments. Um, okay, maybe just one. <laughs> uh, corrections for those of you that don't know. Um, <laughs> um, and people would say, You're, you always smile. How is it that you always smile? And my answer is always the same. I woke up. Right? I mean, to me, every day is a good day if I woke up because that's where it all starts. And so it's a conscious choice I make every day to have a good attitude and bring that attitude into everything that I do. But attitude is everything. And it's something that impacts you individually and it's something that will impact your team as a whole. So you have to make sure if you're a part of a team and you see a member of your team either struggling or frustrated or maybe not having a, an attitude that is going to be collectively beneficial to the greater good, that you have a conversation, right? And it's not always about beating them up and saying, hey, you know what, straighten that out, you know, and, and whatnot, right? It's not putting on the mom hat. It's being a team member and saying, hey, you know what's going on? Uh, maybe it's something that you can help them with, right? Maybe it's a skill that they're, they're frustrated, that they're not sure how to get past something, but you know, you, you might have some ideas. Um, as a team, you have to solve those problems jointly. Because at the end of the day, teams succeed or fail together. Adopted teams. This is one of those dynamics that I think is really interesting. Um, and this is when bits and pieces or parts of teams already exist and you're coming in. You're coming in either as a new member or as a new leader. How many times does that happen? Right? I mean, it'd be nice if we could say, okay, you, 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 and you are my team. And our effort is gonna last two years, and oh, by the way, you can't leave, <laughs> right? You can't leave this department, you can't promote, you can't, 
you just stay right there for me, right? It doesn't happen. People come and go all the time. So you would, we adopt teams. Really important that if you're coming in new to a team, that you work to understand the purpose of that team. You don't go in and say, no, 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 you know what, I'm here now, we've got a new purpose, right? That team exists, understand their purpose. If you inherit the team, that means you didn't have the benefit of selecting the team, right? You've walked into this new team, so you need to take efforts to understand who are the individual members, what are the skills they bring to the table, and how do you benefit from each of those individual skills and then collective skills combined? How do you motivate the team? Right, if you're coming in new, you know, maybe they loved their last leader or their last team member, and that person left and everybody's looking at you and going, you know, well, you know, you're not as happy as they were. Well, they used to bring cupcakes every Friday, right? <laughs> you know, right? So, so how, do you, how do you figure out how do you motivate that team? And it's not always through things that we think it is, right? It's not money always that motivates people. It's not always cupcakes or, or donuts or whatever, right? Sometimes it's understanding value. And it's being able to feel as though you're contributing or providing some value. And then again, attitude is everything. I don't care if you're on the team, if you're inherited the team, if you were part of the team from day one, attitude is everything. So in closing, I leave you with this. The strength of the team is each individual member. The strength of each member is the team, right? So what does that tell you? Don't go out there and do it alone, you won't make it. It's a really hard world when you're trying to, you know, traverse the, the, the roads by yourself. It's a whole lot easier when you have people there with you, people that can help pick you up when you're struggling and people that you can help pick up when they're struggling. So recognize that in most organizations, in most functions, you are part of a team. Take a look around yourself, figure out who your team is, um, and start to, to develop some teammanship. Because I think you'll find that you'll go much further when you do that. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to um, Sarah to, to introduce Liana, and, and Liana will take you to the next level. So how do we do this? We have an understanding that teams are important. We have an understanding of where they start to make sense. But then how do we find out what we don't know? To Andrea's point, right? We can join a team, new team, we can adopt a team, we can come in as team members or a leader and have a sense of what's going on. But how do we really dig underneath the surface to find out more so that we can take action on those areas? So we're gonna pause for a minute and think about if you're a restaurant owner. You own this restaurant, business is doing pretty good, you can go around to the tables, ask people how their food is, they could do fine. Then one day you're going to Yelp and you see some reviews going on about who too salty, service, all of those things. Right? But you went and asked the server, right? You went and the server went and asked the guests, but the guests don't want to tell you, right? They don't want to be rude, they don't want to offend, they think you might know better. Leaders on their our teams are no different. So as a leader, you can ask, how's the team doing? How are we doing? And you might get a fine. The fine doesn't take us to action, right? Fine doesn't give us more in-depth understanding of what we need to know in order to make sure that we can build those teams that are high performing, that we can build a team that goes to, to 7-0 in, uh, in the game, right? So with that in mind, turn it over to Liana, who's gonna talk about her case study and her team's journey of working with a group of individuals and how she used analytical approach uh, to form a high-performing team. Oh, okay. <laughs> the magic band behind the curtain. <laughs> I'm short, so they have given me, hopefully, this is, can you guys hear me in the back? Yes? Okay. The video's good? Yep. Good. All right. All right, so thank you for the introduction. I am Leanna Bailey Crimmins. I am the CalPERS Chief Information Officer. For those of you that don't know much about CalPERS, we are the nation's largest pension fund with over $280 billion worth of assets. 
We are proud to serve those who serve California, and we strive to provide world-class customer service. And always trying to change it up and give um, improvements to our technologies to those 1.7 million members. And of those 1.7 million members, we have 1.3 that are enrolled in our health care plans. Throughout today, you're going to hear a lot about leadership and transformation. Webster's definition of, <laughs> of transformation is basically a change to a current state. So change is inevitable. And um, one of the things that I want to ask you is when we talk about transformation, how do we apply transformation to our most valuable assets, our people? Embrace change. Like I said, it was an, it's inevitable. I got into technology because I love change, right? It's good, but it's also change. And one of the other things I strive to do is be a great change leader. So today we're going to talk a little bit about our case study that we did at CalPERS been there in about a year and a half, and talk about how we've been able to transform our organization to be a high performing and establish a culture of excellence. So, let's go ahead and go to the next slide. I'm sure you all feel this way. Change is complicated, even good change. So some of the things I want to highlight is some of the change I was walking into in my organization. It's all good change, but when you're doing it all, all at the same time, it can really affect your team dynamics. So my team had just come off of a 10-year project implementing the MyCalPERS system. If you haven't heard of it, it's a fairly important uh, system out there. And being 10 years on a project, and then all of a sudden now they're actually going to maintenance operations, their world, who they were, their identity changes. They're no longer in project mode, they're maintenance and operations mode. So what the leaders of the organization did before I got there is they reorged in order to align the staff to a sustainable model to support that system. But talk about moving cheese, a lot of these people were sitting over in different buildings, sitting for 10 years with project teams. Now they potentially could have been reorged into new units, new managers, and worked with whole new people that they've never worked with before. So it's all good change, but I'm gonna, hopefully I stop hitting that thing. Um, but it was it was an, it was starting to affect our team dynamics, how well we individually were interacting with one another. I came in and we had a 19 um, percent vacancy rate. Uh, the board, we were very lucky, they approved 99 new positions to support the system, but it was a huge effort to recruit the right individuals in a very short period of time. We were able to reduce that 19% vacancy rate down to 7% in the span of 12 months. It took a lot of hard work from HR and ourselves, <coughs> but we were able to do that. And remember, well, the other thing that happens is when you have an organization as large as mine, I have about 640 people, individually the division chiefs worked extremely well they knew how to they knew how to make decisions on networks and data centers and within their own individual divisions but what needed to happen now was they needed to actually take that division half off and be able to make decisions for the greater good of the organization so that's the type of change that was turning within the organization so what do we want to do we wanted to become a high performing team so how you do that is you establish common goals. We develop our strategic plan and we establish our, our goals. We also set goals for our teams, which is extremely important. If you don't know where you're going, anywhere will get you there, right? Um, we didn't want that in the organization. The other thing is, again, decisions for the greater good. When you're used to making decisions within your own organization, within your own division, they, the, the thing that they were struggling with is they wanted to be decision makers for the greater good and for the enterprise. But they were struggling with how do you not lose your, your individuality and the strengths that you have within your own organization. When we talk about taking the hat off of your division and now you gotta have conversations at an enterprise level, they thought that that was also getting rid of their identity. And so they had to understand that that was not the case. We were gonna find a way to build off the strengths and make a decision that's good for our customers and good for us. And I'm sure you've dealt with this consistent communication. I'll tell you to my customers, it doesn't matter. When something happens, it's all IT. There is no finger pointing. And you don't want to call different leaders within the organization and find they have different stories. You want to have one voice. So one of the things we were trying to put together is, is 
improve our communication. We put out weekly decision-making uh, newsletters. We have lunch and learns. There's a lot of different things that we do so that there's consistent communication. And I'll tell you, this is what I tell my staff. We can sit in a room and storm a norm and do all that and have healthy conflict, but once a decision's made, we walk out of the, out of the room, we're all on the same page. It's extremely important. Because if not, if we're split, I'll tell you the staff are the first ones to feel it, right? So those are the things that we were trying to strive for on our high-performing team. Thanks. So there is no one size fits all. There's, there's different types of team, team building. We brought in an organizational change management expert. Most of you think of that when you're dealing with projects, right? You bring an OCM expert because you have to take people from this state to this state. But you can also hire an OCM expert to help you with establishing and, and making the healing happen from within out. And so the staff were able to create visuals of where they felt the organization were currently and where did they want it to visually be in the future. So it was a very healthy uh, process they went through. We went through surveys. There was person to person, there was informal, there was anonymous. But I'll tell you a CalPERS, one good thing, staff have no problem sharing their, uh, their, their thoughts. Um, but I'll tell you, as a leader, it is not a problem that I am worried about. It is a problem that I don't know about that worries me. So I, I really believe the surveys were great to understand what problems did we need to solve. And I already talked about the other outreach. But we're, I'm a technologist, right? I love data. We use analytics for lots of things. So one of the things we, we embarked on, we actually hired HSG to come in and talk about how can we use data analytics to transform the team. So that's what I'm going to take you through in the next few slides. Go ahead, next slide. So data is powerful. And it allows you to laser focus on your problems. If not, you're boiling the ocean. You don't know what you're focusing on, right? So we started off with individual assessments. I sat, I found out my operating style. I found out that I'm a very flexible individual. I love to collaborate. But guess what happens when I get out of that environment? My brain is still putting all the dots together in the car, in the shower, in bed. It's <coughs> happening. And then I make a decision. And guess what? My staff have no idea how I went from one point to the other. So I needed to learn to signpost more. So I had to learn about myself because I'm going to be an individual contributor to a larger team. We also wanted to assess the team. How well do we think we were functioning as a group? And then we wanted to focus on one project. When we sat down, it was like, gosh, just, you know, every single time we would, we would dealt with all the IT senior leaders, there's a lot of agendas going on. And there's a lot of, of motion happening. So the one thing that, that HSG asked us is, what team would be the most um, invaluable to put together that's going to affect this organization <coughs> in the next 12 months? So we created a MyCalPERS optimization IT leadership team. It was a very small subset of my, my group, but it allowed those individuals to focus on a single uh, path forward. So I told you a little bit about, I, you know, it's, it's, it's important for the leader of models the behavior. So you don't have to look, necessarily look at all the things on the, the left, but really what I want to sh show you is there's some things that I felt that the team was doing individually strong what I felt that they were doing okay with. And there was really nothing too bad. I felt that they were somewhat fair and okay. But how do you think the team felt that they were doing? Next slide. A little bit different. <laughs> well, I always kind of say that I think the team is always harder on themselves than anything. <coughs> and, and I guess I'm more, more optimist, the, the glass is half full. But, my perception of what they were doing in relation to communication and, and morale and those areas, I thought that they were doing better. But what HSG is going to talk to you a little bit later is that's normal. You know, we are di viewing the, the word of team from different viewpoints. But guess what happened that came out of this particular set of analytics? We were able to laser focus on the things that were most important, which were the largest gaps that we needed to work on versus trying to work on everything. So the areas that we felt that we really needed to focus on was personal development. We needed to work on um, shared objectives, uh, engagement, and um, the group norms, and the external perception. Even though there wasn't a huge gap, we felt that, that we wanted to get it from the fair to the strong area. Next slide. 
So what was our process? That's the other thing. IT people love processes, don't we? Uh, so we had to sit down and have a conversation about what those results were. That's the first place to start. And allow people to be able to just dialogue about it. Why I thought it was one way and why they thought it was another and, and what we needed to, to do to shore that up. We uh, talked about our operating styles. I told you I'm flexible. I tell you, I don't know how it happened. I guess it's a blessing or curse. Um, I have every single type of operating style in my team. Love and death, some of them are in the back of the room. Um, but it, it makes it wonderful because you get different perspectives. But it is sometimes hard to move the ball down the field when you have you know, a defensive line, you know, all sorts of different perspectives. Uh, we also sat down and wanted to establish a purpose for our team, goals, measurable objectives, and outcomes. And we wanted to make sure we had weekly touch points. And we needed to reassess after six months, figure out if we've gotten any better. Next slide. So guess what? We did. So um, the blue bubbles were the, from the first survey. And look how far those areas moved in the span of six months. That wasn't just miraculous, it was a lot of hard work. People had to feel safe, they had to feel it was a part of the team, we had each other's back, we were a work family. And then you can see the green dots of where we moved the ball down um, when we took the test in September 2014. There's still things that we are working on, I mean that's, that's every team. But one of the things I found is the external um, perception. We are, again are harder on ourselves, we think our customers may not um, always see the value that we're bringing. And so what we're trying to do is market that value more. But again, without the analytics, we wouldn't have actually known what to, excuse me, to focus on. And I'm getting over that cold, that nasty cold that everyone's getting. <laughs> All right, next uh, slide. So what's today look like? I'm actually gonna look at my notes, because I wanna make sure that I don't lose anything. So. The team keeps each other accountable for the greater good. Pretty important. Again, when we make a decision, it's for the greater good and we're holding ourselves accountable. The team keeps, um, uh, we have a can-do and find-a-way attitude that allows the team to creatively overcome obstacles. There's no bad suggestion. We should all be looking at things from different perspectives. I have one gentleman, wonderful, he, but he's a devil's advocate. You want Somebody, you know, starts to say, hey, I'm going in front of the board, I need you to look at this and tell me what possibly could jump out at it. He's the man to put it in front of it. But without knowing his strengths, I could have actually thought he was a naysayer and really thought that that was a hindrance. But now that we know our operating styles, we're actually shifting it to be a strength. We market our team successes. Extremely important, not only internally, but we're doing it externally. Um, you know, I know people talk about technology being just a utility. It is our job to market our successes because no, no one else will. It, it just, we need to do that. And we have a decision-making authority uh, framework. So who has the authority to make which decisions? If no one knows who has the authority, they struggle. No decisions are even made. So try to push those decisions down to the lowest level. And already said establishing one voice for staff. Don't hear different stories from different parts of the organization. So that concludes my, oh, we have five minutes left to do some questions and answers. So that concludes my presentation. Thank you for the opportunity to talk about our uh, case study. And I look forward to answering uh, any of your pointed, more specific, interested, interested questions during the Q&A session. So thank you very much. So how do we start this process? What can you do after today to really start to lay the foundation for building a high-performing team. So there's a couple of tools <coughs> one way to do it. Number one, so what you're looking at here, and you may have recalled earlier, now I'm talking about how she actually varied from her team and her response. This is normal, right? It makes sense. Back to the restaurant owner earlier, not really having a sense and understanding of how customers might be experiencing their restaurant, leaders are the same. So what you're looking at here is the average deviation that a leader has from their team right, on these 12 attributes. So the black line down the center is how the team rated itself on average. And the blue represents the variation from the team that the leader has. Right. So two things to take from this. Number one is that as leaders, we might have a sense 
And the sense is pretty good, right? But what do we do with that sense? How does that take us into action? That doesn't give us enough information to actually implement, to actually take action, to actually start incorporating some of those things that Leon was talking about earlier. And the second thing to notice is that, in general, leaders tend to skew more positively than their team. So Leon's point, she had a perception that things were going a little bit better, and that's totally normal. It makes sense, right? You see the light at the end of the tunnel, you see the vision, you're, we're leading the team forward, right? Teams may have a slightly different perspective. They might be in it understanding things different. So how do we find out what to do? Right? So first tool, these attributes right here, take them, feel free to use them. Take them, sit down with your team, use them to have a more informed conversation. So instead of asking, how's the team doing? We can ask, how are we doing on communication? Where is it that we need to improve, right? We can really focus in and pinpoint those questions and probe a little bit deeper. Second, is as Liana spoke earlier, and Andrea spoke to, is what's that win, right? Patriots, clear, easy win, winning the Super Bowl, right? Some fans, to born California, I know. Others, right, we understand our individual goals as teams, but sometimes that shared objective isn't as clear. So feel free, use this template, sit down with your teams, draft up where is it we're trying to go and what are our goals, right? Um, and then you can pulse check, right? Every, five, every six months, sit down and say, how are we doing towards these goals, right? That is setting a strong foundation for building a team. And you'll be amazed at how your team, once you have that clear direction, what they can achieve. So um, feel free, this is here. Uh, we have a couple of other, you know, if you have questions about your team, you're welcome to stop by our booth this afternoon. We'll have a couple of other tools that you can use. Um, and, and many of you filled out a survey in advance that highlighted these attributes. Okay? So you have them, they have them as a resource. Um, so with that, uh, additional questions, thoughts that, that people have. Yeah. I'm curious how that, uh, the metrics were generated. Was that simply on the basis of self report surveys? Uh, because the margin of error tends to be fairly high on those until your end approaches a thousand. Were there actual empirical uh, measures that were used to derive those values so that you can determine that you felt within the standard deviation? Mm. <coughs> so I want to make sure I understand the question correctly. So it, since you're asking, are the attributes, does that graph right there reflect an accurate um, representation of a sample. But when you measured these axes that you gave the established values for, uh -huh. did you determine those data points uh, using solely self-report surveys, yeah. or as an individual of a team, I would say, well, I think our communication is four out of five. Mm -hmm. Or did you uh, look at a whole bunch of emails and other things to make an empirical determination based on actual data yeah. that that is where our team is performing? You know, obviously, there are limitations yeah. in resources and what's available, and you don't always have the option to use those types of data-driven empirical evaluations, but they're, they're much more accurate. Because I looked at the employees about 600, and that, that margin of error is going to be very high, even if all 600 reports. So I'm just wondering how the data is going. Yeah, yeah. Um, can you guys hear me? No. So, you can try it. So um, just, just so you understand that the way the tool works, people don't even know their, their, the, what they're answering is related to communication. So it's taking it from different scenarios, and it's like four different questions for different types of So it's not like you say communication, how well you're doing, rank one to ten. It, it's almost like a Myers-Briggs. I don't know if any of you have taken it. it. The staff really have no idea. They're just answering honestly from different situations, and that is actually rolled up, rolled up to... Uh, <laughs> I keep hitting the mic, don't I? Um, to actually say that it's a communication or it's a perception. So I think it, it is somewhat empirical um, in a valid. Right. I would say it's much more valid. Scale and you, you Absolutely. It the yeah. No, I, you don't even know that you're you're answering it for that particular category. Oh, we're done. Oh, okay. So. Um, we have a little bit of time before lunch, so Andrea is able to stay. If others have questions, we'll be here. And then um, we'll be down at our booth for the rest of the afternoon. So feel free to stop by with questions. Thank you.